Okay, and we're on. Okay, so, um, like I mentioned just a minute ago, um, today we are going to continue with talking about chapter four topics, which is about cultural landscape, cultures in general, components of culture. Chapter five, which is about identifying markers of culture, like your gender, like your race, like your ethnicity, things that were on the quiz just a minute ago, right? Um, and uh, also talk about politics from chapter eight, because on Tuesday, or maybe it was Thursday of last week, I can't remember when, um, I announced that we we're reorganizing those um, chapters that were indicated on the syllabus. We're going from chapter four through seven to chapter four, five, and eight for, um, for this next, you know, this next week, next Tuesday, when we'll have um, one more lecture about these topics. Okay, so um, in chapter four, the, the concepts from chapter four, five, and eight that we're going to combine today are these. So in chapter four, we talked about something called a hierarchical, if I'm going to spell it right. Oh, there it is. Did I spell that right? Why? Well, let me stand back and look at this. Did I spell hierarchy right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's like, oh my goodness, when I take when I take my Sudafed, thank check. you very much. I have to ask Siri for these kinds of this kind of thing. Um, anyway, so cultural hierarchy or hierarchical culture, which is hard enough to say, I better not try to spell it too, right? Is a concept from chapter four. H-E-R-A-R-C-H-Y. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, okay, um, you never know what word I might or might not be able to spell that day. So anyway, um, hierarchy is, uh, well, what does it mean? You tell me. You've heard the word before. You can spell it easier than I can. What, is, what does hierarchy mean? The higher power. Yes, it has to do with power. It has to do with some people being elite and some people, you know, in other words, the people who have power, we would call elite. I believe this is a word that is used in text in your textbook when it's talking about hierarchical culture. The people who have power in society or the elites can sometimes serve as the impetus, as the stimulus for spreading culture from a hearth where it begins outward, okay? So we're going to talk about power and uh, those who are able to influence society and culture. We're going to talk about a word that might be new today. I'm not sure if we have defined this together before. Undoubtedly, you've heard this word in other classes that you've had, especially if you've taken sociology classes or um, anthropology classes. Ethnocentrism is a concept that we're going to examine and look at today. Ethnocentrism, who's heard this word before? How can, help me, help me define this word. You uh, think your culture is superior to others? Okay, you think your culture is superior to others? That's a good start, and I like the way you worded it there. So it's so let's write that part down, and then let's talk about some nuances that we can add to that that helps us understand ethnocentrism a little bit deeper. So yes, ethnocentrism is, say it again, the idea that your culture is superior, okay? So the idea that a person's cultural group that they belong to, right? Their identity, in other words, if we're going to bring concepts in from chapter five, the idea that a person's culture is superior to another person's culture. This is a really good basic understanding of what ethnocentrism means. Absolutely. So this is a really good starting place to understand this word a little bit more deeply. I want to talk about this word in relationship to hierarchical culture, in relationship to identity like we've been exploring in chapter 5, the idea about identifying against others, um, which is on the first page of chapter 5, I think it is, first couple of pages of chapter 5. All of these concepts of the you, the me, the us, the them comes from this tendency 
we should include in a deeper understanding of the word ethnocentrism a tendency for all of us to think that our way of life is correct. We accidentally, we, every human being, I don't care what identity we're talking about, every human being has a tendency in their learning process when they are learning to be a member of their cultural group, every human being has a tendency to think that not just that their way is superior, but that their way is their way because it's natural. Look at my air quotes that I'm putting around the word natural. I'm this way because it's just supposed to be. It comes naturally to me. And so we all have a tendency because we are raised up in our immediate cultural group, we all have a tendency to compartmentalize that. We definitely derive our social identity from the things that we learn, the places that we go to, the neighborhoods that we participate in. That becomes part of our comfort zone, like we discussed in class one of these most recent days. And it becomes part of the way others in society see us and categorize us. And this ethnocentrism idea is a tendency that all of us have, all of us. You might think that you are the most tolerant person on the planet. I hope you are. I'm going to have a contest with you to take over your spot, okay? <laughs> but um, despite the efforts that we might go through to be tolerant or to be understanding or accepting of diversity, all of us have a tendency to be, what's the word? almost used the word shock. Maybe shock isn't, I don't want to be that dramatic, but we all have a tendency to have some kind of surprise when a difference that we didn't know was there happened. You know, we notice it for the first time, right? In um, my cultural anthropology class, for instance, and my culinary students in that class um, love it or hate it when we do this, but um, we talk about eating insects in, in cuisine. Um, insects are a major, you know, they're everywhere, right? I mean, they, we don't even have to um, make a farm to grow insects because they just do it really well in nature by themselves. And insects have really high protein, really low calories, really, I mean, really high protein, high calories. Why are you making a, a, an ethnocentric face? I see ethnocentric faces from you all when I'm talking about eating insects. <coughs> anyway, I bring in bags uh, of, of sour cream and onion crickets and bacon and cheddar. We like bacon and cheddar crickets, don't we? Who doesn't like bacon and cheddar, right? But <laughs> I see some, some people saying, yeah. Um, so anyway, you're having ethnocentric feelings right now. Okay, um, so even if you're not judging someone harshly um, based on that, if you're just grossed out by it because it's not part of your cultural background or identity, then that you, I need to point out to you, and I'm with you also, I need to point out to you that ethnocentrism is where that, ooh, gross feeling comes from. Because we didn't learn that food way, for instance, in our ethnicity. And I saw your hand up a minute ago, and I didn't come to you, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, the article that said by, like, 2050, we're going to have to, like, implement insects and do, like, our regular life. I know. I'm sure some of the culinary uh, classes are reading about implementing insects yeah. in, in everyday um, food. Because, yes, and we can go back to whatever chapter it was when we were talking about demographic transition and Thomas Malthus who is a famous theorist about how our food supply was going to run out if we keep um, increasing the population like we were. Uh, he said that we were increasing the population exponentially, and the food supply was only increasing linearly, if you remember back when we were talking about that. And uh, however, I would ask, as an anthropologist, as a cultural geographer, I would go back to Malthus and look at his writings and his theories very carefully from the lens of not my ethnocentrism, but whether his predictions had ethnocentric ideas incorporated in them. Because if you redefine what food is, maybe there is plenty of food in the world. Um, I tell my sociology classes sometimes, 
the story about a friend of mine from, she, she grew up in Taiwan, and Taiwan is a tiny little island um, in the Pacific Ocean, um, the China Sea, and uh, since it's an island in the salt water, what kind of food do you think um, is very, very common in Taiwan? Fish. All kinds of seafood in general, fish, definitely, seafood in general. Have y'all ever heard of um, anything called a sea cucumber? Mm -hmm. Have you heard? You should look it up really quick here. Ask Siri to show y'all some pictures of a sea cucumber. And it, <laughs> you don't want to. You know, okay, I'll just tell you that it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like the gel that's, you know, to me, it looks like maybe a, a, I don't know. I know. It looks like maybe a thing of like melted Vaseline or something. Yeah, so I like you. So you can have that imagery, even though you're not going to ask Siri to show you those pictures. Anyway, so she tells me things like, oh, there are other um, sea creatures, all kinds of sea creatures. So when we say fish or when we say seafood, we probably, I'll, I'll get to you in just one second, we probably have this idea of what kinds of sea creatures are available from maybe the Kroger counter, right? The, the, the Kroger selection, right? But there are so many other things when, um, when I go to the grocery store with, um, with my friend, we love to cook together. Um, when I go, she, she doesn't want to go to Kroger with me, which is one of my favorite, as an Estado and did say person, one of my favorite um, places to go, with the little yellow sale, sale stickers. Um, but she doesn't like to go there because she said it's boring. The foods are boring. There's just... There's just the same kinds of fish, the same kinds of meats, the same kinds of everything over and over, and she'll start telling me about all these different sea creatures that they eat, including the sea cucumber and other things that are just as yucky in my ethnocentric judgment, right? But she also has a phrase, a common language phrase, which we will get to language in chapter six when we come back after midterm, but she has a common phrase in language about meat, terrestrial meat. What does terrestrial mean? On the ground, not the seafood that we're talking about. And she said in Taiwan a common phrase is that the only thing with four legs that people don't eat is a table. Think about that for just a second. Piece of wood. It's, that's the only thing with four legs that they don't eat. Didn't you say that it was a seafood? Was no, she said about? terrestrial terrestrial meat. So yeah, seafood, they eat seafood. everything. They eat everything from the sea that they can possibly get their hands on. But they love meat, like pork and beef and chicken and the things in the in the counter at Kroger. But those things are very scarce because it's a tiny island nation. So we have to use our geography so that it benefit the human environmental interaction of the geography there is there's a whole lot of people and so you have to build up in a lot of skyscrapers and, and apartments so that there's enough housing for people and there's not a whole lot of space at all for ranches or anything like that that would be necessary to um, raise cows, raise pigs, um, not in large quantities so that people could eat it all the time, right? So um, instead... Uh, there is a custom that the only thing with four legs that they don't eat is a table. And so I think about this morning when I opened the door to come to class and my cat had left me a little mouse there that he had gotten. I'm glad he got that mouse, right? But what I did with that mouse is dispose of it. I did not harvest that to include it in my diet. But just like with your comment about the bugs, would you say 2050, uh, probably we're going to have, the prediction is, probably we're going to have to redefine what is edible and what's not. You're not going to do it, Dave? No? no when, you said, when you said mouse, I had to pick up a dead rat. Yes, no. exactly. Rats, mice, all these like, four-legged things, they're perfectly no, edible. Like, they're perfectly no edible. Pick it up, so like, fine. They're perfectly edible. Tarantulas, yeah. crickets. Cockroaches, perfectly edible. Mm -hmm. Perfectly edible. And some of the things that we eat that we call seafood, like shrimp or lobster, are the first cousins to these things that crawl along the ground. And we eat those readily. 
right? So this ethnocentrism thing, back to ethnocentrism, I get a little sidetracked when I start talking about food because I love <laughs> to talk about food, but back to ethnocentrism, but let me ask you what you wanted to say first because I um, saw your hand up. Yeah, it was about ethnocentrism. How, I mean, um, I understand you, you're saying um, you being disgusted at something represents ethnocentrism, but based on the definition of ethnocentrism, do you think that your culture is superior? Just because yes. you're disgusted by something doesn't mean that you think that your culture is better, you just don't do it. Let me rewrite this definition of ethnocentrism so it has a little bit more of a nuance to it than what this says. Okay, so that's one of the reasons I wrote this one down, and then we had this discussion to get those. You know, I, I'm sneaky, right? I chose a discussion that I knew people were going to probably be like, gross, I saw Kiera's head back there. She wasn't even looking at me. She just couldn't stop her head from going, no, <laughs> right? She's like, I'm not going to talk about this. So ethnocentrism, a more nuanced way of understanding this concept is to say that it's the tendency to judge other ways of life using your cultural standard. We can use a word from chapter five, using your social identity, right? Ethnocentrism is really the reason why we have this concept of identifying against others and having solidarity. You know the word solidarity? Unity or a feeling of oneness with the group to which you do belong, okay? So ethnocentrism is a tendency to judge other ways of life using your way, your ways or your cultural group's ways as standard. Using your way or your cultural group's way as a standard. So Yes, ethnocentrism is very nuanced. There's a positive side of ethnocentrism. Um, ethnocentrism is, we can look to this concept as the source of loyalty and feelings of solidarity. I think that no one would be able to successfully argue that a feeling of solidarity with other people is not a positive human relationship. A feeling of identity that is bound to your social place, that's bound to your ethnic group, that's bound to your gender category, any of these other identity markers, these feelings of solidarity with people who are similar to yourself is a wonderful boost to the human condition. Ethnocentrism is where we get that. Do you like a sports team better than the next sports team? If so, ethnocentrism is why. Do you like a religion better than another religion? If so, ethnocentrism is why. Do you have patriotic feelings, especially around Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Veterans Day? If so, ethnocentrism is why. So there's a positive side to ethnocentrism. However, um, this is sensitive, it's a sensitive kind of thing because if there are powerful people in society whose identity, whose idea of right versus wrong, idea of appropriate religion versus inappropriate religion, idea of appropriate political system versus inappropriate political system, if they use, oops, I meant to <laughs> circle the whole thing, if they use, um, their ideas of right or wrong and impose it on other groups because you just need help, you just don't know any better. And I'm here, I'm here to tell you that you need to know better and I'm the one who has the standard that you need to follow and I have power to impose it on you whether you like it or not. And that's when ethnocentrism can really be a problem, right? Um, I can tell that none of you are ever going to participate in, you know, I don't know, uh, grasshopper tacos, right? 
I can tell from your reaction here, tacos maybe is a good idea, but filling it with grasshoppers, maybe not such a good idea. No, I've had it. It's very delicious. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, I didn't mean it's extremely <laughs> delicious. I have pictures of it on my phone, uh, not this phone, but another one if you care to see them. Um, but I'm sorry, I did not mean to like activate the gag reflex there. <laughs> but okay, stop talking about it. Wow. Wow, y'all can't handle the food stuff. Well, unfortunately, um, the example that I'm going to look at today with you, we have a short. YouTube videos like 10 now minutes. Now it's stuck in my head already. Why are you talking about it? <laughs> Goodness gracious. I thought I was using like a benign you example. Too much detail. You went into too much detail. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. TMI, TMI, yes. TMI. Okay. Yes. Okay, well, I mean, gosh, to me, the sea cucumber thing is like way grosser. But anyway, I mean, I'm, I thought I was using silly examples. Y'all, you know, didn't get very worked up when I talked about imposing a political system on somebody who didn't want it. But gosh, if I talk about grasshopper tacos, we want to have a march on Washington. Or <laughs> okay. Do what? No. no, okay. Well, anyway, we will, we will just have to see. Maybe your babies or your grandbabies will be the ones to decide whether it's on the, men, the menu for Taco Tuesday or not. But at the, back to ethnocentrism, okay? Back to ethnocentrism. Because culture is something that can be controlled by powerful people or identified as important or not important by people in power. Let me recall uh, your minds to when we were discussing um, the, uh, what's it called, the World Heritage Sites from the United Nations, UNESCO, right? In those World Heritage Sites, I think all of us can agree this is a wonderful list of things that I am gung-ho to preserve for posterity. However, did you see necessarily anything on that list of cultural heritage sites that called attention to atrocities that have happened in the past? Genocides, for instance. Who knows this word, genocide? Who knows what that word means? What does it mean? Yeah. Centuries of, well, you, you won't know if you want to. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's the systematic extermination of an... Uh, People. I think that you have exactly the dictionary definition memorized. It's a systematic extermination. Anytime you see this suffix on the end, a homicide, a suicide, any of these, this means death. And gen here comes from a Latin word that means people, an entire cultural group of people. So you can look across the world in different places and find many examples throughout history of genocide. These genocides are the result of extreme ethnocentrism by power elites who had the muscle to come in and, you use the word extermination, yes, exterminate others who they identify against for whatever reason, religious markers, ethnic markers, racial markers, any sort of social identity concept um, sexuality markers, um, any kind of um, social identity concept that we've discussed in chapter five and will continue to discuss in future semester, in future weeks um, after midterm of the semester. Language, religion, huh? Okay, I could name four examples right off the top of my Give, head. Us, give them to us. The, the examples uh, of genocide? Uh, the most famous one was definitely Hitler and his genocide. The Absolutely. The second one was. Hitler Turkey and the Holocaust? And the Armenians. The Armenians in Turkey. Uh, the other two, I think there was one attempt in Bosnia. I think it was like Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh -huh. And then there was another one, I think it was a, uh, a country in the Caribbean or South America or somewhere around there. Well, let's not uh, forget like, Stalin, who killed tens of millions of his own people. Let's not forget someone called Pol Pot in um, Cambodia, who murdered well, so millions. Was, he just killed anyone. I mean... That was more like repression. He wasn't targeting a specific. Yeah, the same. Well, the well, same word applies. The same word applies. Word so unfortunately, these are things. Often we think of genocide as a political issue, a human rights issue, right? Because culture, ethnicity, identity 
Um, these kinds of concepts are increasingly considered human rights. Your ability to identify as the cultural group that you see fit, that you're, um, that you're, the rest of the, your category of people is, has a feeling of solidarity around. That is increasingly an idea about, um, uh, that sometimes power elites, if, if your cultural group is not, doesn't fit the standard, then um, sometimes you can be a target and not only marginalized, but maybe genocide is um, the result. Right now, I think in y'all's, um, I know for online students, but I think in my face-to-face -face classes also in Blackboard, I've got, um, what is it called, a discussion board in Blackboard where you can get reaction paper ideas. And I think I posted for y'all the idea, it's not about genocide, so I'll erase that, but it's about ethnocentrism. It's about power elites being able to segment and separate society based on identity. There is a movie that um, Peter Jackson, I think, the guy who did um, Lord of the Rings, yeah, that director did this movie. It's called District 9. And it's a sci-fi movie about an alien group, I don't remember the name of the group, that like uh, came to Earth to make, anyway, it's, it's about hierarchy. It's about power elites controlling a differing identity from theirs. And it's really um, a commentary on the apartheid system of South Africa. Is it about um, identifying, I mean, the movie, what's the movie called? This, is it on I think I remember seeing it. It might be. It might be. I, it's, it's an older movie, um, at least. Oh, is it that recent? I was thinking it was going to yeah, be like 2002. Yeah, look it up really quick. So ask Siri when District 9 I remember came out. Seeing but anyway, I've got it. Um, if I don't have it in your, um, uh, uh, what is it called, discussion board, I know for sure that I listed it in, um, in the online class. It's a really good example of. I mean, we could have used it as a five themes of geography um, movie, but also it's a really good example of how a cultural hearth or power elites can disperse their ideas of proper culture. What's it? What year was it? Two thousand nine. It's two thousand nine. Oh, wow. No, no, no. It's, this is the name of the movie. Yeah, two thousand nine. Okay, I was thinking it was older than that. Anyway, so I'm not sure what service you, it, it might be free on YouTube, I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm, I su get surprised uh, with movies being available free of charge on YouTube. But anyway, this is, I think, a really good movie to look at and analyze from this concept of otherness, this concept of identity. Because even though it's a human versus an aliens kind of theme in this movie, um, this has a human element. This comes from... Um, a historic example of power elites and ethnocentrism literally segmenting people in one district, District 9, of a city with curfews, with rules that are applied to that particular group because they are different from the powerful group. And this is something, unfortunately, that we see all over. Um, genocides, certainly, such as the ones that you all gave me the examples of and the ones that I added to that list, are examples of ethnocentrism, overt examples of ethnocentrism. But there are so many other examples of ethnocentrism that we can find. For instance, can we apply this concept to gerrymandering that we learned about in class on Tuesday? If, if, for instance, those maps that we were looking at, where, that we get that information from the U.S. Census, and so we know this particular area is predominantly Hispanic or Latino, this particular area is dominantly um, Asian, Pacific Islander, et cetera, those different maps from Chapter 5 that we looked at. Um, if power elites know that this is an African-American area, and this is a Hispanic area, and this is a whatever other area, and voters here are going to tend toward one issue or another that's important, 
or a particular political philosophy over another, um, power elites can draw those voting district lines so that either this group is advantaged or disadvantaged based on the controlling, the controlling power. Um, yes, sir. Um, can we still do uh, uh, the uh, reactive paper on gerrymandering, or is that trip sales? Is it a no, I'll, gerrymandering is a good um, a good topic to continue with. Yes, yeah, as long as we're talking about the political chapter, which we still are. Okay, so yeah, so gerrymandering would be good for next week too. Okay, so good question. All right, any other questions or comments um, about this before we take this ethnocentrism discussion? From this is really kind of like a macro level where I'm talking about like governments and power elites imposing culture or limiting your ability to identify in ways that don't go along with their definition of reality. Uh, and then we're going to take it to a little bit like smaller scale and look at how different uh, ethnic identities around the world uh, can impose ethnocentric kind of um, behaviors on each other. Any questions? Okay, so if one comes up while I'm erasing, please speak up. Yes, I highly recommend that movie, District 9. It's entertaining, but also, if you look at it from an educated lens, you know, and when you know how to analyze something, it can give you a lot of um, insight, you know, into the way these, the power elites can control um, social structure and society. Okay, so um, let's talk about how gender and power, so a gender identity and power, can affect um, your social reality, can affect your ability to fully participate in your social group, okay? So gender and power. Okay, so there's an example in, I believe it's chapter five. There's many examples for gender and power, and one of the ones that I want to highlight right now is about women in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I see all those books open, I already opened to chapter five. There's a map in there, or there's a section on women in sub-Saharan Africa, so if y'all can just tell me the page number so I can announce it for, um, for uh, online students. But anyway, I wanna talk about this gender power relation because, what page? Found it. Yeah, that's the map, isn't it? Oh no, that's the world map. Okay. 135. 135, somewhere around there. Okay, so, um, gender, remember, this is culturally defined, a culturally defined set of behaviors. Okay? Culturally defined behaviors. So, female is a sex word, but woman is a gender word. Okay? Girl woman, these are gender words because a woman has certain culturally defined behaviors associated with her existence, associated with her identity as a female person of a certain age, okay? Childbearing, taking care of the household, these kinds of duties are commonly associated with women's roles worldwide, okay? We are in a stage four society regarding demographic transition. We are in a post-industrial society where women's rights at, um, and position in society, even though it's not perfect, and many of us will complain about the inequalities that still exist in our social structure, in our stage four status in the demographic transition model, women have more rights more authority, more access to full participation in society than they do in other places in the world with less industrialization, less democratization, okay? Gender, for instance, in this Sub-Saharan Africa example from your textbook, women have specific household roles that dominate their occupation, their education level, their ability to participate in the economy as a worker is extremely limited because their socially ascribed role is that they must bear children, they must take care of the children, they must take care of the men in the household, they have these duties. 
okay? So for instance, I'm specifically uh, mentioning the Sub-Saharan Africa example because in the rural areas discussed in the textbook, they lack infrastructure. What's infrastructure mean? What's infrastructure mean? It's like uh, the facilities that uh, allow government to really function. I mean, well, not really, but well, so I would I would substitute the word government that you used for society in general. It's about uh, infrastructure comes with industrialization. Right? So we have roads, we have bridges, we have water resource facilities, um, sanitation, sewers, those kinds of things are included in infrastructure. Internet services are included in infrastructure. Okay, the electrical grid, this kind of thing. So many places around the world that are not, that are in those categories of developing or underdeveloped nations have infrastructure shortfalls. That's really mild. That really puts it mildly. There's, uh, you know, we watched that video of that hillside in um, Brazil where there wasn't proper sanitation, right? It looked like there was a whole lot of building going on, a whole lot of um, population, but the infrastructure for sanitation services was not there, right? And we know the, the problems that that causes with, um, with public health. Well, in Africa, where I'm talking about here, there's a lack of infrastructure, but there's not a whole, there's not a high population like that example in Brazil. So it's not so much that the infrastructure can cause, it does cause issues with public health, but lack of infrastructure here can affect a woman's role in society because if your job as a woman is to take care of a household, and one of the essential things that you need in your household is clean water, and infrastructure is not near you to provide clean water, and there aren't roads, and there aren't cars to transport you, a lot of your day might entail walking miles to a clean water source and back with the amount of water that your family needs for the next two or three days walking miles to forage for foods that to supplement whatever food that you do get from a store or something like that. So a lot of times a woman's role, this culturally defined behavior, can limit that individual or that group of individuals' ability to uh, participate in um, industrializing the society or becoming educated so that advancements can happen and infrastructure can eventually take place and stage four demographic transition can occur in your particular area. I believe it is um, Oprah Winfrey who is mentioned in the textbook. She's one of many. She's one of the most influential, but she's one of many public figures who um, puts a lot of emphasis on women's roles in Africa and the social uplift that's necessary um, in order to improve conditions across the board. Women are key in improving conditions across the board. Many, many sources give us that information. However, if in your culture, this word power rests with males, and here we have to talk about the nuances of power, because now we're not talking about power elites, people who control government, but people whose gender role is defined in very different ways than the other, okay? So here when I have males under power, um, we can talk about a concept called patriarchy, Patriarchy, again, this is the inequality, this is the ranking, right? Anytime we have this suffix on a word, we have ranking in society. This patriarchy, what does this prefix stand for? Y'all heard this word before? What's, the, oh, um, what's this prefix uh, stand for? Father. Or Specifically male. father. In general, we use it to, say, to mean male, yeah, yes. Yeah. In, in Latin, pater um, or pater in Latin means father literally, but we use this to mean male. 
So there is a power structure in most societies worldwide, our own included, where males, simply by that ascribed status that they have at birth, males have an easier time negotiating public space, negotiating social um, structure and culture, because the culture is developed, has developed over time, to think of males as dominant and females as subservient. And if you don't know these words, well, I mean, dominant, of course, you know, but subservient means coming under. And if you didn't know that word um, already, maybe from my hand signals, right? Like dominant is here, subservient comes underneath. And the word servant is also in that word subservient because women worldwide, very often you find gender definitions where the woman is the server, the woman is the caregiver, the woman is the support staff that helps society move forward from a domestic sphere, meaning a household, rather than from an economic or a political sphere, education sphere, where males tend to dominate. So, your cultural identity, I'm using gender here as an example, obviously, but your cultural identity with any of the markers that uh, we have discussed in chapter five can be assigned to you at birth. You can inherit these things at birth. You don't have to learn, well, you will learn how to negotiate your reality uh, throughout your lifetime. However, you can inherit many aspects of your reality simply because we are born into, males and females and intersex individuals alike, are born into a social pattern that pre-existed us, pre-existed our parents, our grandparents. We inherit these patterns and therefore it shapes our cultural identity, it shapes our sense of place, it shapes our position in the hierarchy. It shapes the opportunities that we might have to, ha to um, experience social uplift. These kinds of patterns in society can dictate what our life experiences are going to be through very little effort of our own. Y'all lost some energy there on me for just a second. Y'all were really participating before that, but now we're talking about, gee, uh, there's a little bit of, um, well, like the, in my sociology classes, we talk about the movie The Matrix, right? Mm -hmm. There's, um, you know, there's a, this predetermined shape of society that we inherit at birth that we have to learn how to negotiate. Right? Or like the maze runner, we can talk about a maze getting from this side to that side. There's one or two ways in or out, right? And society shapes those, those pathways for us. So, questions? Anybody? Okay, I want to continue talking about the gender relation here but also add another component to it. I'm going to use an anthropology word here, kinship. Okay? Um, kinship is a very common um, way of people identifying their social groups around the world. In the United States, kinship is, um, kinship is important. Who's your family um, is important. What your family finds important is sometimes important to you. Carla and I were just talking about that before class started, right? You know, my parents are this. I like to make them happy, so I do it too, right? Even though it's kind of not my thing, right? So um, kinship can be a big motivating factor for how and why we develop our identity, self-identity and also social identity throughout our lifetime. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering if I could look something up real quick. Was, oh. There was a book that related to infocentrism and the genocide. I cannot remember for like me. I think I know what it is. But I sure, look remember. that up and then share it with it. Yeah, and um, often, I'm glad you mentioned the word. Oops, I didn't mean to 
to scratch that out. I'm glad you uh, mentioned the word ethnocentrism again because a lot of times kinship relations can identify large groups of people uh, worldwide. For instance, if you pay attention to much international news, uh, this morning driving into school, I was listening to a report of a um, an army ranger who uh, had gone to Afghanistan for three different tours. She was talking about um, how lucky she felt that she was because she only had three tours in Afghanistan and some of her counterparts had 10, upwards of 10 different tours, right? But in Afghanistan, she experienced a lot of different, what she said was tribal relations. You've heard this word tribe, right? Often in the United States, you'll hear this word tribe in relation to Native American groups that were displaced when Anglos arrived. Yes, so tribes are kinship words that are collections of family lineages that form like a power relationship and a hierarchy among them and work as a group, sort of like a confederacy, you could call it, um, working together as um, a unified social group, a tribe. And so in Afghanistan, for instance, um, and many other places throughout the world, tribal hierarchy is part of the social structure, tribal hierarchy. Um, okay, I'm getting a little off track, and I, I want to show you this video, so um, let, me, uh, let me get back to kinship really quick. So kinship is often a very important identity marker worldwide. Who your family line is and who my family line is is often so important that people will have arranged marriages in order to... Um, in order to uh, unify one kinship group with the next, okay? In the United States, when we hear the concept of arranged marriage, do we like that idea very much? No. Do we like the idea of, you know, people who are, have a higher position within our bloodline choosing who it is that we're going to marry and reproduce with? No. Well, this is a very common thing worldwide, however. Arranged marriages are very common worldwide. So we don't like the idea. We're ethnocentric about it. Other places, such as India, another um, topic that's addressed in Chapter 5, other places like India have had a very long-standing tradition of arranged marriages for centuries and centuries and centuries. But in places like India that had colonial powers take over and establish governments there, who knows what colonial power occupied India for Britain. Britain. Thank you. Britain came in and established uh, India as part of the um, as part of the Queen's dominion and the king before her. Um, and in this in India, arranged marriage is extremely common. It has been common in, among lots of different kinship groups. Sometimes the arranged marriage is within the kinship group to keep it pure. Sometimes it's outside a kinship group in order to establish an economic relationship, for instance, or um, additional land holding, or whatever kind of motivational factor um, that is, or you know would be behind that. But arranged marriages is something that the Brits and at least those of us in, in this room are kind of against. And that kind of against is because of ethnocentrism. It's not part of our cultural identity, right? Um, but these kinship, the necessity of keeping marriages approved of by your kin has brought about concepts around the world like dowry, like bride wealth and also bride service, these marriage exchange systems, so to speak, I don't want to sound like it's you know an auction block or you get a wife on eBay or anything, but these are marriage exchanges, economic exchanges that are part of many arranged marriage systems that require, um, for instance, a in the, the dowry system, it requires a bride's father or the bride's kinship group to provide 
It could be money. Often it is money or at least things that are valuable enough to be sold for money if, if the bride needs support. It is furniture. It is household goods. It's a whole bunch of different items that can be used to contribute to the groom's household because the bride is coming and bringing not only her mouth to feed, but what's the idea? She will have children. The marriage is going to result in children. Bride wealth is another one of these exchange systems where the bride's family takes from the groom's family, the opposite, takes from the groom's family a sort of payment um, for their trouble or for the absence of this woman from their household. Bride service is the same kind of thing where the groom or the groom's representative must devote um, a period of time, maybe it's six months, maybe it's a few years, maybe it's until that first child is born or a first son is born. You have to devote work time to the bride's family in order to um, make up for their loss of her and the offspring that she will have that will bring work and benefit to another group. So quite often social identity for women has all around the world, even in advancing economies like India, we maybe have just heard um, of President Trump's visit to India where he was talking about all the economic advances that, were, that are happening there and the big um, you know, uh, advances in development toward industrialization that are happening there. But I, if we look at this particular custom that still exists in India, though powerful elites in the past have influenced governments, influenced laws to try to get rid of arranged marriages, this kind of pattern in India, instead of going away because these laws are against it, you see increases in, um, in arranged marriages. And think about that as far as ethnocentrism and otherness identifying against power elites, resistance to impose power, these kinds of attitudes, think about something that is important to you. Apparently, even our food is important enough to talk about whether we do or do not want to include other items in our food supply that uh, you know, we haven't always defined as food. We define as a pest instead of food. Um, if someone came in and the prediction is our, we will need to include insects in our diet by 2050, if someone came in at that time and said everyone must include insects in your diet, you must begin now, you must begin today, I'm going to monitor you to make sure that you are including these insects in your diet instead of eating beef or instead of eating pork, we're going to ration these things. How Would you be happy about this? You're going to be very happy. Would you have hard feelings against the people who were trying to impose this rule on you? Would you fight against these people? Would you go underground and have a black market on beef and chicken and whatever they were? Yes, I mean, you would have, many people do. Well, yeah, and and it. honestly, I'm going back to that food example because I thought it was kind of a silly example that we wouldn't have too strong of a feeling about. But if you don't want someone to tell you what to eat, imagine power elites occupy with a different culture altogether, a different social identity, a different philosophy in life, a different religious background, different everything. Imagine this power comes in to say, this is not right from a human rights standpoint. You need freedom of choice. Does this sound nice, freedom of choice? But if this was your cultural way, your entire life, your mama's entire life, your grandmama's entire life, let's keep on going back in history, is that very easy to give up like your beef, pork, and chicken? would be easy to give up. No, and, and sometimes this might be even more important. So sometimes my definition of human rights, I, I want this gone. 
because my group's definition of human rights is you're violating the participants' human rights by forcing this on them. Well, and not only that, because like in other cultures, it's important to their culture because like they want to keep their like bloodline. We have to look. Back. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot of motivating factors why this was part of their cultural background to begin with, as you as you pointed out, right? So the issue is here. Um, back to cultural hierarchy, back to power elites having power to impose culture on others, identifying against others based on differing ideas of reality. This is not part of our reality. None of us in this room like this idea. But if, as an individual, my, my question for you is, if as an individual, I don't have the right to impose something on you as an individual, if I don't have that right to impose something on you as an individual, then when we zoom out and we look at power elites who influence society, influence what gets out into popular culture or modern culture or whether folk culture survives or, or dissipates, um, What's the difference between me as an individual imposing something on you or a group of powerful people imposing something on you group of less powerful people? It's a tricky, it's a slippery slope. It's a tricky situation, right? Your definition of human rights, my definition of human rights might be very different. And so where where does ethnocentrism start and stop? Where is the safe line where you're not imposing on others' rights? Um, and instead, um, <clears throat> you know, equality can happen. It's a philosophical question, isn't it? Deep. I didn't know we were going to get so deep today in class. Yeah, I think that's funny because, like, well, you know, we're, we're married, you know, I mean, I'm a TV show that I was watching with. Yeah, we and we like those kinds of TV shows that show us, with like National Geographic Taboo or something, right, that shows us different ways of life around the world. We like to see these things because, wow, it excites our ethnocentric ideas, and we're thinking, wow, there's an us and a them that we're looking at there, right? And so here's our cultural identity at play when we see those kinds of things that are, that are very, very different from ours. And I did plan too much to do in today's class with you because we're out of time. Uh, but there is a video that I think I'm going to post um, online for you all to watch in addition to, you know, uh, what we've done today in class together. So even though we can't watch this video together, it's an uh, Associated Press little... Um, mini documentary, I guess you would say, about arranged marriages and in particular a concept discussed in chapter five, dowry deaths, bride deaths, and um, there's kitchen accidents that um, happen that are in the news all the time in India because if your father fails to pay the dowry or if you fail to produce those sons that you were supposed to produce when this arranged marriage happened, um, there's a, there are some issues with uh, planned murder, planned hits. Um, uh, quite often a groom's family will um, get rid of the new bride if the um, arrangements for dowry, if the arrangements for whatever exchange was um, understood, don't happen. So I'll post this um, uh, video online for y'all to watch and it's something that we can start the day with on Tuesday next week. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. And see you online students later. Bye.